I would actually like to introduce the first moderator, and he will um, be moderating and introducing the, the keynote speaker. Um, the first moderator is Professor Amit Chabra, who is actually a board, an ICERM board member, and he's also vice chair of public relations for ICERM. Uh, Professor Chabra is ambassador and permanent representative to the United Nations. He is a bank regulatory attorney. He's a visiting professor of international law at St. George's University and an adjunct professor at New York Law School. So with that, uh, Professor Chabra. Thank you for those kind words. Uh, good morning, everybody. <clears throat> as Basil pointed out, uh, this conflict that, that we face is not old at all. And as we know, the UN is celebrating its 70th celebration uh, anniversary this year. Um, and so to kick things off, we wanted to start off with the question of how does our work as diplomats intersect with development and defense. Uh, specifically, we're, we're calling the title um, Faith and Ethnicity at the Crossroads. And this is particularly important, actually this weekend it's very important because while we're meeting here, there's, a, there's also a global rally for humanity, as we probably know. And that's a movement um, against anybody of the Islamic faith and it's worldwide. Um, so as we sit here in Yonkers, New York, in Syracuse, New York, there's rallies against um, Muslims and mosques, sit-ins outside mosques. Um, and the idea is that it's going to sparkle additional efforts against various um, ethno-religious groups. So let's keep that in mind and where we are um, in context of things. Our first uh, speaker today is a recipient of not one, not two, three, four, but five PhDs. Um, that's like a lifetime of work, like eight years per. Um, he, is, he has a PhD in poli-sci, one in developmental economics, one in linguistics, um, computer science, and mathematics. He's a professor of research methodology and political science at Howard University, a research in residence of Abrahamic connections and Islamic peace studies at the Center for Global Peace in the School of International Service at American University. He's also the special envoy of the African Union Peace and Security Council and the director of the African Institution. Anything I missed? Um, he's the author of 80 books and more than 600 scholarly articles and the recipient of more than 200 major teaching and other scholarly and community service awards. Um, Professor Abdul Karim Bangura, please join us at the stage. Well, true to our African culture and tradition, I have to ask the permission of the elders in this room before I say anything. So with a nod from the elders. <laughs> thank you for the permission. Uh, this is the longest, shortest trip from Washington to New York, 30 minutes flight that took seven and a half hours <laughs> because of the postponement and the cancellations. And the, it was very interesting. By the time I got here, it was 3 a.m. this morning. Wow. So if I sound incoherent, I have an excuse. <laughs> so I called my daughter this morning because I said, Dad, I've been worried. I'll be calling the hotel to say you're not there yet. What happened? I said, well, I, you know, they said the weather, the rain stopped six hours ago, but it's still the weather. Uh, as we say in America, the season to be silly. And of course, our own brother here in New York, our great Donald Trump, could not help himself but tell us that when Mexico sends its people, they are not sending the best. They are not sending you. They are sending you people that have lots of problems. And they are bringing those problems. They are bringing drugs. They are bringing crime. They are rapists. And some, I assume, are good people. <laughs> but I speak to brother guards, and they are telling that's what we are getting. 
And then there are another one that is doing very well in the polls. Our own wonderful African-American brother could not help himself either. Now he's telling us, Brother Cass is telling us that uh, Muslims should not run for the presidency of the United States or hold any office in government. And uh, when they ask him, do you really believe this? He said, yeah, I agree that uh, Islam and the wrong and stupid, not my words, the how words, so that way I can make sure I get out of New York. Not only are they factually stupid, but that he had made the gross sin by stating that Mexicans are not only evil, they are all rapists, all of them, they are all drug lords, but also the country of Mexico itself is evil by deliberately sending, quote, those people with, quote, those problems. And uh, for our wonderful brother, Carson, why we may forgive him for being oblivious to the history of African Americans in this country, and given the racism that he himself endured, if you read his book, Gifted Hands, six chapters were devoted to the racism he endured as a youngster, and what he had to deal with and had to overcome. Then one then can say if he's oblivious to the fact that the majority of Africans that were brought to these lands came from Muslim countries, especially in the west coast of Africa, like Guinea, the Gambia, Senegal, Sierra Leone, and parts of Nigeria, then the likelihood that his ancestors were Muslims are even greater. If he's oblivious of that fact, then it also means that he's oblivious to the fact that the Constitution and the history of the United States is steeped into Islamic tenets. One of our great sisters from here, from Columbia University, by the way, who is now a professor at University of Texas in Austin, wrote a great book, Thomas Jefferson's Quran. Islam and the Founders, where she documents with authentic original documentation of the debates between the Founders, both the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. So this idea of Muslim not being a president in the United States is smooth. But again, Elections have a very funny way of bringing out the worst in some of our politicians, and some of them don't even read. And as you see, three of our great congresspersons who are Muslims, uh, took their oaths on Thomas Jefferson's Quran. And again, there's no time to delve into the details, but anybody who's interested can look at that. And some of our own works, especially the one on Islamic sources of peace, we have demonstrated that Islamic democracy is consistent with Western democracy and the concepts of democratic participation and liberalism as exemplified, as exemplified by the Rashidun Caliphate. And of course, the great Al-Farabi, who is known as the second master, and Aristotle is called the first master, already regarded democracy to be the closest of the ideal state pointing to three branches of government which is so reminiscent of our American system. The leader, who is to be elected by the people. The Sharia, which could be overruled by ruling juries, if necessary, just like our Supreme Court do. 
And of course, this has to be based on the Shura, a special form of consultation practiced by Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, which means that's what our Congress does. So we already know that. And we also know from the great scholar, Hassan Ali ibn Muhammad ibn Habab al Marwardi, that there are three principles upon which Islamic political system is based. The Tawhid, they believe that Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, is the creator, sustainer, and master of everything that exists on earth. The Risala, the medium in which the law of Allah is brought down and received. And of course, the Khalifa, a representation. Man is supposed to be the representative of Allah here on earth. So we see no contradiction whatsoever between Islam, democracy, and the American system. Just because some of our leaders in Muslim state fail to live up to the teachings, to the tenets, does not make the deen, the way of life, incompatible with Western democratic system. Indeed, that faith and ethnicity are major political human fault lines in our world is hardly a matter of dispute. The nation state is the typical arena of religious and ethnic conflicts. State government often try to ignore and suppress the aspiration of individual religions, ethnic groups, or impose the values of the dominant elite. In response, religious and ethnic groups mobilize and place demand upon the state, ranging from representation and participation to protection of human rights and autonomy. Ethnic and religious mobilizations take a variety of forms. So we see international relations continuing to change. We see, as we further point out, in keyboard jihad, misrepresentation and misperception of Islam, we noted in that work that nation states are becoming relatively irrelevant in the greater scheme of things. As we all know, when the Soviet Union collapsed, we saw a whole lot of ethnic breakups. Right now, we're dealing with ISIS. We had to deal with Al Qaeda that are not states, but have become the reality of our international conundrum. <clears throat> so given the issues of faith and ethnicity, a metaphorical linguistic analysis then makes sense. Why? Because as I demonstrate in my book on unpeaceful metaphors, metaphors are not just more picturesque speeches that we live and we are consumed by the metaphors we use is hardly undisputable. And as the great Anita Wenden tells us, we assimilate new experiences so as to allow the newer and abstract domain experience to so that we can understand terms of the former and more concrete and to serve as a basis and justification for policy making. And as the great Lakoff, George Lakoff and Mark Johnson put it succinctly, the concepts that govern our thought are just matters of the intellect. They also govern our everyday functioning down to the most mundane details. Our concepts structure what we perceive, how we get around the world, and how we relate to other people. Our conceptual system therefore plays a central role in defining our everyday lives. If we are right in suggesting that our conceptual system is lightly metaphorical, then the way we think, what we experience, and we do every day is very much a matter of metaphor. So therefore, we should be outraged, those of us who are 
in the international peace and conflict resolution work. Now the type of metaphors we use to describe and to caricaturize one another based on our differences in how God wanted us to appear and based on our differences on what faith path we decide to take, we should be really ashamed that even the animals in the so-called jungle may have learned a lesson of two that we as humans have not yet achieved. So therefore, what are the type of metaphors that have engulfed us in faith? A young lady did an excellent research, and we'll get to that a little bit later, that tells us that none of the major religions can be absorbed that its believers, its followers, have not participated in terrorist acts and have not evoked their various religious beliefs. But then again, these are conceptual metaphors. They are poetic metaphors. They are mixed metaphors. They are nominal metaphors. They are predictive metaphors. And they are sentential sometimes, even in how we structure our syntactic systems can be very dangerous. So we then have to create a certain similarity between what is known and what is understood, just like an automobile or machine, and what is complicated and perplexing, like our American society. We as listeners then should be surprised and forced to make the transfer, and perhaps even challenge, instead of being quiet, to some of these very divisive metaphors. So what are some of our metaphors of faith? Of course, as a student of the Abrahamic traditions, what my brother did not mention, I am a Muslim, but I attended the Roman Catholic school. So I served mass as an altar boy when I was young, when I was a little boy. So I read my Bible from beginning to end, end to beginning. And at my office table and my bedside table in my bedroom, I have the Torah, I have the Bible, I have my Quran. And when my father was assassinated for political reasons in Sierra Leone, the person that took care of me, that gave me sustenance, was a Jewish rabbi, Eliotov. So you cannot get so much kindness, so much love, so much caring without learning the traditions of the person who's providing. So I was fortunate enough to read the Torah in Italian. And I have all my copies of the Pentateuch and other books that he gave me to this day in my library. So I was blessed in many ways that out of misfortune, I was also able to learn. And I'm still a student of the Abrahamic connections. In the Holy Torah, we learn in Psalm 34, 14, that keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking deceitfully. And I'm just taking one example. There are tens of these very negative metaphors that the Quran, the Bible, and the Torah teaches us against. And the Holy Bible, Proverbs 18, 21, it tells us that death and life are in the power of the tongue. And they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. So we do get our penalties. And the Holy Quran, Surah Al Nur 24 24, and it warns on the day of on the day of judgment, their tongues, their hands, and their feet will be a witness against them as to their actions. So we begin to see that it is very clear 
from all three of the Abrahamic faiths that uh, unpeaceful metaphors are not really kosher. They are not tolerable to any believer. And uh, we then see that some of the problems we had with Al Qaeda, for example, was this rhetoric of religious metaphors. And I recall reading the Nidal Islam, the call to Islam, where Osama bin Laden said, what bear no doubt in this fierce Judeo-Christian campaign against the Muslim world, the likes of which has never been seen before, that the Muslims will prepare all possible might to repel the enemy, militarily, economically, through missionary activity, and all other areas. While these words may sound innocent to those who do not understand the tenets, for those who call themselves holy warriors, the jihadists, which is a misnomer, because jihad does not mean war. The Arabic word for war is not even <laughs> jihad. And therefore, those who are confused may read too much into such statements and engage in their own willful acts. Unfortunately, we also found the same thing on the other side. As our great former president, George W. Bush, declared, we are not engaged in a crusade. Well, for Muslims, and knowing the history of what the Crusades did to Muslims and other minor, minority Christian groups, that message did not sit too well with many of our brothers and sisters in the Muslim world. Matter of fact, even Iran, after 9-11, that had over 80% of its population siding with us in the United States, supporting us in whatever action we have to take. As soon as our president went to Congress and said Iran, North Korea, and uh, Afghanistan are the axis of evil, the next day that sentiment changed. Why? Because axis of evil connotes a very unpeaceful metaphor to the Iranians. So we saw that support shifted. So what religious language could be so cogent and powerful to sway a person to sacrifice his life to destroy others? We usually try to just explain things away in the most simplistic form we have to understand, or try to understand at least, why somebody with a medical degree, a law degree, a PhD, an engineer, would decide to become a suicide bomber, who has everything to live for, who have everything to look forward to, why? What are the ways we characterize those activities? We as scholars and we as activists have to also begin to demand uh, answers from our leaders. Well, fortunately, fortunately, and I have to say this, for, to be fair, George W. Bush learned very quickly. As some of us in Washington galvanized and tried to educate him, we saw a shift, not only in his activities, but also frequent visits to the Muslim world, and many programs that he launched in the White House to try to create dialogues, interfaith dialogues, support of religious groups that do work in various parts of the world. Matter of fact, I was one of the beneficiaries when Cote d'Ivoire almost came down to a religious war, when Christians went and butchered those Muslims in one small part of Cote d'Ivoire. I was one of the people that worked with the Bush administration to go there and bring clergy, Muslims, Christ, uh, uh, Catholics, and Protestants to Washington, train them, send them back to those communities, 
and they were very successful. And follow-up trips, uh, follow-up uh, dialogues uh, did show that uh, Bush's initiative and what was advised did uh, divert the Avorian crisis to more a political one than the religious one, which would have been very damaging. And we also have to be honest that because of 9-11, because Bush learned, we also have to be honest in our book assessing George Bush's Africa policy, in order for him to fight the war against terrorism, he realized that he needed the cooperation of African leaders. He realized he needed not only the cooperation, but their own perception, their own views of what the conflict is, and he listened. And he even went there twice. On the second trip, his polls were down almost to zero. They asked him, where are you going? He said, I'm going to Africa. I say, why? Because that's where they like me. And we have to be very honest that Bush did more for Africa than any president before him, and definitely more so than the president we have now in the White House. And that we have to be honest, even though he's our black brother. Metaphors of ethnicity. Of course, unpeaceful metaphors of ethnicity are some of the worst since the post-Cold World War, because internal conflicts now are considered to be major form of violent conflicts around the world, and most of these are based on ethnic factors. They can lead to internal conflicts in two ways. First, ethnic majorities exercise cultural discrimination against ethnic minorities. Cultural discrimination might include inequitable educational opportunities, legal and political constraints on the use and teaching of minority languages, and constraints on religious freedom. In some cases, draconian measures to assimilate minority population combined with programs to bring large members of other ethnic groups into minority areas constitute a form of cultural genocide. And in fact, as you can re recall, interestingly, when the Greeks and the uh, Turkish engage in their cultural cleansing, what did they call it? An exchange program. A very cute way to justify what they were doing. And we saw the same thing in courts the former Yugoslavia, we saw the Serbs, we saw what they call the Velian victims, we heard this is an hegemonic aggression, we heard Serbia becoming the heroic defenders. And when two groups in close proximity are mutually exclusive, incendiary perceptions of each other, the slightest provocation on either side confirms the deeply held beliefs and provides a justification for retaliatory response. Under this condition, conflict is hard to avoid and even harder to limit once it has started. So we see a whole lot of unpeaceful metaphors used by political leaders in order to promote tensions and hatred among ethnic groups through public statements and mass media. Africa is a great example. There's not an African that does not speak more than four or five languages. There are a great deal of intermarriages between various ethnic groups. There are a great lot of movements from one ethnic area to the other. And yet still, we allow our political leaders to get the best of us and divide us based on an ethnic cleavages. So then, there are three categories, and that is the idea of holy sites. The idea of insecurity. The idea of terrorism. Whereas one person's terrorism becomes the other person's what? Freedom fighter. The idea of revenge. The idea of self-determination and independence and self-defense belonging into category one. And to category two, we hear about genocide, 
We are about ethnic cleansing, hate bias crimes, and others. In retrospect, the connection between the escalation of ethnic conflicts and the exploitation of unpeaceful men force can be utilized in the efforts of deterrence and COVID prevention. So the same tools that they use to divide us along ethnic lines can also be used to create those barriers. And we saw here in our own great old US of way, where the young black male, some of us who have young black male children, we are so afraid when they go out past five, six o'clock, that they may not come back home safely. Why? Because we see a whole lot of cop killing, not only white cops, even the black cops. They have to show that they are also very determined to stop young black males from committing crimes, so they join the bandwagon effect. We see shooting in churches where people go into a church and decide to just shoot everybody because they are of a different ethnic group. And we see the same thing where the latest one, a young man goes to a place and asks you, are you a Christian, what kind? We see all of those things. Why? Because later on, as we begin to check their background, we begin to understand what sort of language, what sort of metaphors, what sort of uh, things that we are said when they are growing up. In conclusion, I've been waived. <laughs> From the preceding discussion, it is evident that our discourses on faith and ethnicity appear as modeled and combative landscape. And since the beginnings of international relations, the battle lines have been indiscriminately multiplied into the intersecting web of the strife we have today. Indeed, the debates over faith and ethnicity have been divided by interests and convictions. Within our vessels, passions swell, making hair throb, vision easy and reason confounded. Swept in the current of antagonism, minds have conspired, tongues have cut, and hands have maimed for the sake of principles and grievance. And as the great Matthew Luther King taught us, democracy is supposed to harness antagonism and conflict, much like an efficient engine harnesses violent explosion into work. What is an African American? without the oppression, the depression, the repression and suppression by white Americans? What is poor without the apathy, revile and elitism of the rich? Each group owes its position and essence to the indifference and indulgences of its antagonists. And Malcolm X teaches us the global economic system does so much to harness a penchant for antagonism and competition to trillions of dollars of national wealth, but economic success notwithstanding that byproducts of our economic India are too disturbing and too dangerous to ignore. Our economic system seems literally to swallow up vast social contradictions. At the root of our problem is the fact that the fragile sense of association we do possess for one another has self-interest as is antecedent. The basis of our social organization and our great civilization is self-interest, where the means available to each of us is inadequate to the task of obtaining optimum self-interest. So for Malcolm X, a complete revolutionary change of the status quo is needed, is called for. And history then has repeatedly shown that we would rather not allow human independent interdependence to breach our various distinctions and bind us together as a human family. As W.B.E. Du Bois correctly points out, rather than acknowledge our differences, our interdependencies, some of us opt to coerce others into thankless submission. Long ago, W.B.E. Du Bois told us, enslaved Africans worked tirelessly to sow the harvest the bounty of the earth for European and American slave masters. From the needs and wants of slave owners, supported by the compelling laws, taboos, beliefs, and religion, 
a socioeconomic system evolved out of the antagonism and oppression rather than out of a sense of people and an honor. And they recently passed away the great Nelson Mandela tells us it's all natural that the deep chasm has emerged between us spawned by an inability to deal with one another. And therefore he called, calls for us to cross this river of grievances. Because he said if we don't, and our next generation inherit, inherit what it is that we're giving them, we have a furious tremors of fear rhetoric and cruel demands that can transform these grievances into Russian rapids. And this violent current will leave us kicking and screaming toward a great fall. And to that, I conclude by saying that unable to assess the failures of our cultural and our ideological antagonisms, Liberals, conservatives, and extremists of every dimension and quality are forced even the most peaceable and disinterested of us to take sides. This made at the sheer scope and intensity of the battles erupting everywhere, even the most reasonable and composed among us find that there is no neutral ground to stand upon which we then have to bring back our clergies to take the lead that they did at various times of our histories so that they also do begin to come into taking sides as every citizen is coerced and conscripted into participating in the imminent conflict. And final words. As our ancestors, the ancient Egyptians, tell us, no matter what we do, we should always do in Ham, Hotep, Huru, and in Kiswahili, we say Katika Amani Daima, and in, in English, it means in peace always. I thank you very much, and now I'll shut up. <laughs> <laughs> The question is, how much of the conflict do we think is inherent in, in the, the human, human genes? genes. Yeah. Okay, I, I don't know. I don't want to get into big trouble here because that's a very <laughs> tough scientific question. How are we going to put some of this DNA and test to see whether or not this particular gene will uh, commit something? And I don't think that's research I even want to get into because we know what happened with these uh, folks that used to quote try to make correlation between genetics and African Americans or Africans, black people being not smart, like the bell curve. I don't think I want to encourage that sort of research because not only is it desired, but it's very bad science. Because we already know that the bell curve is a myth because again, once you break the various classes into economic, then the, the story changes. The reason I ask yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, it seems to suggest mm -hmm. that something about the human experience mm -hmm. uh, suggests that there will always be conflict mm -hmm. based on just how we are as human beings. All right. Well, yeah, I mean, it's human nature, but again, I don't know how, because once you start trying to quantify DNAs, then you're going to start saying, People with so-and-so DNA are more prone to, you know, that gets a slippery slope <laughs> uh, uh, type of scholarship. It is, but it doesn't yeah. mean that you throw out everything. Oh, no, no, I'm not throwing out, but that's just something I'm not going to do. <laughs> yeah. Yes, please. Uh, last weekend, there was a two-day conference at Union Theological Seminary okay. on uh, confronting religious extremism. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Thomas Jurgens Meyer was, uh, who, who has written uh, books on uh, confronting with religious extremism, mm -hmm. and ISIS in particular. Mm -hmm. um, he actually said that he, that, that he 
highly doubts that Osama bin Laden had anything to do with 9-11. Mm -hmm. I'm just putting that out there. Sure, sure. Um, and, and there are other conferences like the Forum and the United National Anti-War Coalition where there are actually panels on 9-11 truth. Sure. But putting that aside, uh, going, going to the topic of uh, religious extremism, a, a lot of the conference talked about um, uh, nationality and religious extremism is, is not part of the, the core religions, mm -hmm. but more uh, it's, it's religion being co-opted by, sure. uh, by, by nation building. Mm -hmm. and, um, religious nationalism mm -hmm. and one also that uh, religion, religion has been colonized. Mm -hmm. You started your discussion talking about borders. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, because I'm an optimist, do you see that, that we could go in a direction where we don't need borders and we could just be one world living in peace? Uh, well, that's the ideal world. If we have a world where there are no borders, there are organizations that believe that and they work for that, borderless, the borderless world and other organizations. I think it would be wonderful, but it's so utopian. Whether or not they, our politicians are ever going to allow it to happen, that's the other question. The thing with 9-11, whether or not it's Osama bin Laden or not, I, there are so many theories now, so many conjectures that it's very difficult now who to believe. And you even have all kind of videos, how the, the Twin Towers came down, and you know, it depends on where one wants to stand. But my concern was that Al-Qaeda never rejected, never came out and said, no, we did not do it. I think that was one of the biggest mistakes. If they didn't do it, I would have been the first out there to say, uh-uh, <laughs> we have nothing to do with that. At least deny something, but I did not hear that. Maybe they did in some places that we are not informed. But for those of us who travel to those other parts of the world, we would have heard something. So it's really very difficult to wash the hands of Al-Qaeda very clean. And there are so many things we hear these days, you don't even know what to believe. Because when I was uh, in Cairo, I was told that ISIS is not even the person who is running ISIS, the leader of the ISIS is a Jewish guy. And I said, huh, you know. And then I start asking friends, people who I know that are in Israel, they say, well, we cannot confirm or deny because we don't know. It may be true or not true. So again, there's so much information being poured out there these days, you no longer know what to believe, you see? They, are, they, 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 they believe in many parts of the, uh, the Middle East is that, well, I don't like the word Middle East, but <laughs> that's the geopolitical concept we use, is that ISIS is really run by a Jewish guy who converted or reverted to Islam and is just fed up with not only what Muslims are going through, but also the Muslim leadership, which is not protecting Muslims. Now, I don't know. And since it's been videoed, I don't know. Okay. I don't want somebody sending it to our CIA saying, this guy said that. Okay. So I think that's all the time. That's a question? Okay, thank you. Thank you so much.